This episode of the Bonsai Network podcast is brought to you by ASAN Bonsai. ASAN is a full-service bonsai nursery located just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. To schedule a visit to ASAN, head over to www.asan.com. That's www.eisei-en.com. What's up, guys? Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Bonsai Network podcast. This time around, I'm coming to you from one of my favorite cities in the entire world, Kyoto, Japan. So for those of you who don't know, I spent about nine years in Japan. I was an apprentice at Fujikawa Koken Nursery in Osaka for about six years, and then I continued to work there after I graduated for another three years. Well, during that first six-year period, for about three of those years, I actually lived in Kyoto. Um, I was dating my wife at the time, and she lived in Kyoto, so we ended up renting an apartment together not far from her university up there and where she was working, and uh, I ended up staying there for about three years. So it became my favorite city in the entire world. And at some point in the not too distant future, I'll do a podcast about the gardens of Kyoto because they sort of tangentially relate to bonsai, at least in terms of garden art. So it could be an interesting podcast. So be on the lookout for that in a future episode. But for this episode, what I thought we would do is take a look at Saburo Kato. Saburo Kato, I'm sure many of you know, is a very famous or was a very famous bonsai artist in Japan. He owned Mon and nursery in the Omiya Bonsai Village, and he was actually my teacher's teacher. So my Oyakata, Fujikawa-san, did an apprenticeship up at Monsayan back in the late 80s, and he graduated in the early 90s. So this would have been really sort of the heyday of Monsayan, the heyday of bonsai in Japan, and my Oyakata, Fujikawa-san, was right smack dab in the middle of that at Monsayan during that period. So we've talked about this a little bit in previous episodes, but during the 80s, that was the sort of bubble economy period in Japan, and a lot of people were spending ridiculous amounts of money on bonsai, and Monsan being in the Omiya Bonsai Village uh, and being such an old nursery with such a long history was able really to tap into that market at that particular time, so they became kind of the nursery to go to during the 1980s. Uh, it was really interesting, too, because Saburo Kato, I believe he was the third generation owner of the nursery, so the nursery, I think, had been found in the 1920s, 1930s, somewhere around there, maybe even slightly earlier than that. Um, and when, when it was originally founded, it was a massive area of land. Uh, and over time, little by little, the land in that area has uh, gotten sold off and eaten up by people who wanted to build apartment complexes. So the nursery sold off portions of land here and there. Uh, I think it was a function of uh, actually property taxes going up. It became very expensive to keep all of that land uh, and just the opportunity to you know make money selling off the land uh, for the family. So in any case, the nursery is a lot smaller these days. Uh, and as a matter of fact, when Mr. Kato, Saburo Kato passed away, I think it was probably seven years ago at this point, um, seven or eight years ago, uh, or maybe even nine years ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, but when he passed away, his son had actually already been uh, running the nursery for a number of years. Um, as a matter of fact, when my teacher, uh, Fujikawa-san, was an apprentice at Monsan back in the 80s, Saburo Kato's son, uh, Hatsuji was already the uh, sort of owner of the nursery. He had taken over the responsibilities of the nursery, and technically he was uh, my teacher's teacher, uh, but uh, Saburo Kato really was still the main guy at the nursery, you know, imbuing his knowledge uh, to the next generation of apprentices. So uh, technically, Fujikawa-san considered Saburo Kato more of his uh, teacher than he did Hatsuji. Uh, and what was interesting was back in those days, uh, at least at Monsayen, the apprentices did not call their teacher Oyakata. They actually called uh, Saburo Kato Danna-san, which translates to husband. Uh, and they called Hatsuji, which was Saburo Kato's son. They called him Wakadana, which means young uh, husband. So it's uh, kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting situation in that regard at that particular nursery because no one was referred to as Oyakata. So in that case, my teacher, Fujikawa-san, considered Saburo Kato more of his Oyakata. Uh, and that's simply because he was the guy at the nursery. You know, he, he looked like he was 100 years old even back then. So he had kind of a grandfatherly type vibe about him, apparently. 
apparently. Uh, at least this is what Fujikawa-san told me. Um, but he was always out working with the apprentices, you know, teaching them what he knew, uh, keeping an eye on you know the sort of operations of the nursery, overseeing everything. Uh, and it was really like that up until he passed away about almost a decade ago. So at that point, when he passed away, um, again, his son was already maintaining the nursery and running the nursery. Uh, but then at that point, his son passed it on to his son. So uh, that next owner of the nursery, as soon as Mr. Kato passed away, he ended up tearing down the original nursery and rebuilding it in more of a traditional style. Uh, so the facility today is set up really, really nicely. There's a beautiful traditional wall, uh, sort of stucco style wall that goes around the exterior of the nursery. Um, and the interior of the nursery is filled with some of the best bonsai in in all of Japan. Some of the trees were created by Mr. Kato back in the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, some of those trees are new trees that get brought in and then sold off. So there's a lot of activity going on at that particular nursery. So the reason I, I want to talk about Monsan is because when you study at a nursery in Japan, like myself studying at Koka and down in Osaka, Wherever your teacher studied, you become sort of like extended family, uh, you know, in sort of that type of relationship relative to that nursery. So for me, being an apprentice at Kokaan, I had sort of an extended familial relationship with Monsan. So each year for the Kokufu, for example, we would take trees up for the sales area. And if any of you guys have been to the sales area and have seen Fujikawa-san's sales booth, he always had the biggest sales booth at the Kokufu, at the Green Club there. Uh, I think he rented is like 24 tables each year, uh, which was incredibly expensive. I forget the amount per table, but it ended up being like $4,500 uh, total, I think, for uh, or 450,000 yen, which is about $4,200 uh, to rent all of the tables for the Kokofu sales booth. Uh, but in any case, to take the trees up to Tokyo, it was a seven and a half hour drive one way. And we only had what was called a high ace. It's a Toyota a vehicle, sort of like a large van. So we could fit a lot in that, but it wasn't like a massive truck. So we would actually have to make two full round trips up to Tokyo to take the trees up there for the sales booth and for the show. So each uh, sort of mid-January or so, uh, there was a pre-judging event for the trees that were going into the Kokofu. So we would load up those trees to be pre-judged, and we would also load up a whole bunch of trees for the sales booth. So we would take those trees up, unload those trees at Monsan, at Mr. Kato's nursery, leave them there, get the trees judged for the exhibition. Uh, whatever didn't make it in, we drive those back down to Osaka, unload them, and then load up a whole another load of trees to take up for the sales area. So during that period that we were going back and forth between Tokyo, the original load would stay at Monsan. So each year we'd spend at least a few days uh, unloading and reloading trees at Monsan. So I got to know you know a lot of the apprentices at Monsan quite well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one guy, Adam Jones, uh, who's from Pennsylvania originally, I believe, uh, he studied at Monsan. Uh, he and I would hang out at the Kokofu sales area every year and uh, shoot the poo, so to speak, uh, just hanging out, talking to each other. Uh, but I you know became pretty good friends with him, and he actually ended up uh, staying in Japan and has opened a nursery not far from Narita Airport. So shout out to Adam. Uh, I believe his business is called uh, Treehouse bonsai so definitely check them out online and give them some support and some love they're on facebook and a few other social media outlets um, but in any case uh, you know became friends with a lot of the guys up at mon sam um, and it was really cool to see sort of the transformation of the nursery prior to mr kato's death and then after mr kato's death saburo kato's death uh, to see you know what the nursery sort of transformed into um, and if any of you guys have been to the Omiya Bonsai Village and have visited Monsan in the last few years, you'll know what I'm talking about. It is chock full of really, really, really fantastic trees. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, some of the best trees in all of Japan and by default in all of the world are on the benches at Monsan. The only issue is that there are so many trees there now, it's kind of hard to see uh, some of the trees because they kind of get piled up on top of one another. Uh, but if you do visit there, make sure to, to really take a look at each individual tree because they have some fantastic materials there. Um, so I, I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of talk a little bit about what Fujikawa-san had told me about during his apprenticeship while he was at Monsan, um, while I was an apprentice at his nursery. So I remember the first summer that I got to Japan, it was uh, May of 2008, Fujikawa-san about once a month uh, would take me out for dinner. Uh, that became uh, less and less, uh, or it was less and less frequent the further I got into my apprenticeship. 
Um, but for the first, I'd say, year or so, about once a month, he would actually take me out for dinner. Uh, and we'd, you know, go have like yakiniku, for example, which is essentially like Korean barbecue, but they use, you know, nice Japanese style beef that's perfectly marbled and is just it melts in your mouth. Uh, he would take me out to restaurants like that or to yakitori restaurants, which is like chicken on a stick kind of thing. But, uh, you know, of course we'd go out and we'd drink a whole bunch and then he'd tell me all sorts of stories about uh, his time as an apprentice at Monse. And so when he became an apprentice there, what was interesting was that back in those days, it was very, very typical for people to graduate high school and then immediately do an apprenticeship at a nursery. So Fujikawa-san's father had started his nursery back in 1958, and by the time he got into the 70s, uh, mid-70s or so, he had trans, uh, transferred the nursery over from a flower shop into an actual bonsai nursery. So when his son was of the age to become an apprentice, his son decided you know, after high school that he didn't want to become an apprentice. He wanted to become a businessman. So he ended up going to uh, Kinki University, which is in the Osaka area, uh, the Kansai area rather, which is like Osaka, Kyoto, Nara, uh, Kobe, kind of that region. So Fujikawa-san went to university for four years. And in his fourth year of university, he decided, you know, this is really going to suck if I just go work at a company uh, and have to sit around punching numbers into a computer. So, you know, he had been helping his dad during the summers at the nursery and had started to really enjoy being around the trees, being around bonsai. So in his fourth year, he told his dad, all right, you know what? I do want to become an apprentice. Well, at that stage, it was actually a little bit too late because again, most nurseries back in those days were looking for people right out of high school. They wanted to, you know, find people who were willing to work hard, uh, who their personalities hadn't totally formed so that, you know, the nursery could kind of mold the personality in the image of what whatever the nursery wanted that personality to be. And, uh, you know, it, it made it a lot easier for creating kind of a, a na natural hierarchy, uh, basically, within the structure of the nursery. So the sort of senpai kohai relationship, uh, senpai being uh, your superior in the nursery uh, and the kohai being the, uh, for lack of a better word, inferior in the nursery. So the person lower in rank. Uh, and then, of course, the oyakata is at the very top there. That's the, the master or the teacher. Uh, so Fujikawa, again, at that time, he was already 22. So when he told his father he wanted to be an apprentice, his father immediately said, okay, we have to get you an apprenticeship at Monsean because Monsean was the nursery at the time. If you wanted to be successful in the bonsai world, that was the place to go study, to go be an apprentice. So his father went up to Monsean to have a meeting with Saburo Kato. And of course, you know, they sat down, they started talking about it. And the question of Fujikawa-san's age came up. And uh, Fujikawa-san's father said, well, he's 22. He just finished university. So Saburo Kato said, well, in that case, I can't can't take him on as an apprentice. He's already going to come in being several years older, almost four years older than the next person in rank above him at the nursery. So there's definitely going to be a conflict there. Uh, you know, it's difficult for people at that age or any age, uh, you know, to have someone who's a superior to them in the nursery who's several years younger. So uh, after, you know, going back and forth several times, trying to convince Mr. Kato to take him on as an apprentice, uh, Mr. Kato finally agreed and said, okay, all right, you know, you pestered me enough. I'll take Fujikawa-san on for three-month trial period, and we'll see how it goes. So Fujikawa-san went up, uh, joined the team at Monsan, and ended up staying for a full five or five and a half years. So, you know, typically when you do an apprenticeship in Japan at a bonsai nursery, it's a five-year apprenticeship, and then you stay at least six months to another year, uh, sort of as a gift beyond your graduation, as a thank you uh, to your Oyakata for having, having taken you on for so long. Um, so that's exactly what Fujikawa-san did. Um, so during that period, uh, Fujikawa-san told me that, you know, he, as the lowest ranking person uh, in the nursery, would have to every night wait for Saburo Kato, his wife, his son, his son's wife, uh, and then Saburo Kato's grandson and the whole family to take showers. And then the highest ranking apprentice would take a shower or, or a bath rather uh, than the next person to rank, so on and so forth. And I think at the time that Fujikasa entered the nursery, he was the fifth apprentice. Uh, they had five apprentices at that time. So he was the lowest of the low. So by the time he was able to take a shower or a bath in the evening, it was already pushing midnight most nights. Uh, and of course, when he finished as the lowest ranking guy, he would have to clean the ofuro or the bathtub every single night. 
So he said that, you know, that just won him, you know, for the first, at least, I think it was at least a year he was there uh, as the lowest ranking apprentice. And he had to do that every single night. And then, of course, the next morning, they were up at about 530, six o'clock in the morning, uh, sweeping the nursery, cleaning out leaves, weeding the nursery, starting the day all over again. And uh, what was interesting, too, is that back in those days, they would put all of the apprentices in the same apartment. Uh, so to fit all of the apprentices in there, you had, uh, you know, traditional tatami mat floor, basically. So three of the apprentices, the three higher ranking apprentices would sleep on futons on the floor in that room. And then Fujikawa-san would have to sleep in the closet. Uh, so there was, there was a sort of sliding door closet that was about seven feet long. Uh, and there were two shelves in there, an upper shelf and a lower shelf for the floor, basically. So Fujikawa-san would sleep on the floor on a futon in the closet. And then the next highest ranking apprentice would sleep on the shelf above him inside of the closet. And that went on for the first year, uh, if not into the second year, uh, until they got a new apprentice. And then the top guy essentially graduated and moved out. So he said it was, uh, you know, a rough time because he would wake up to have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and he'd sit up and smack his head on the shelf above him <laughs> and wake up everybody else uh, in the room. So uh, luckily for me, when I did my apprenticeship, I didn't have to necessarily go through that. So I did have my own apartment a few minutes away from the nursery. Uh, but for me, you know, I had all the room to myself. I didn't have to share it with anyone, which was great. But uh, I think I was very, very lucky in that regard. And that's sort of become kind of the norm for the most part at nurseries in Japan. Some people will stay at the nursery if there's facility uh, or room enough there. Uh, and then some apprentices will stay offsite, which is what we did at Fujikawa-san's place. We each had our own apartment. So I couldn't imagine staying with all of the other apprentices in one apartment. You know, you're working all day together from sun up till sundown. You go back to the apartment, you're with them all night long. And you know, the, the tensions start to arise. So Fujikawa-san told me that a lot of the apprentices or a couple of the apprentices anyway, that he was with uh, during his time at Monsan, uh, they're no longer on speaking terms, uh, which, you know, makes sense to me. I, I think, you know, being in that situation, it would wear on anybody to have to be around uh, the same people all day, every day. And you're getting, you know, max maximum one day off a month typically in that situation. Uh, and back in those days, because business was so good, because it was so much work to be done, uh, Fujikawa-san told me that they were getting maybe one day off every three months, uh, particularly during the busy season. Uh, so when I did my apprenticeship, I had about one day off a month. Uh, during the kind of busy season, it might be one day off every two months. And then in the sort of low season, which was actually the summer months, uh, when things kind of slowed down, uh, sometimes I get one day off, uh, like, every week or every other week. So uh, that time of year was uh, much more enjoyable than the busy season in the winter prepping for shows and whatnot. Uh, but, you know, it, it's just interesting to see sort of the, the shift and the change in how things were done back in the 1980s during the heyday versus how they're done now uh, in typical nurseries as, you know, a, an apprentice master relationship or in terms of how that's uh, concerned. Um, but in, in any case, you know, Fujikawa-san would take me out for these dinners. We'd sit around and he'd tell me all sorts of stories uh, about, you know, living at Monsan, working at Monsan. Uh, but one of the things that was interesting, again, was that, you know, his Oyakata technically was Saburo Kato's son, but everyone in the nursery really viewed Saburo Kato as sort of the guy, the guy who was there to teach, the guy who was, you know, imbuing his knowledge to the apprentices. And that's why those apprentices had shown up uh, and signed up to do an apprenticeship at Monsan. Um, you know, so for those of you who don't know, Mr. Kato was very, very famous for creating uh, forest plantings, rock plantings, and especially for dealing with Ezo spruce bonsai. Uh, so Ezo spruce, you know, they grow mostly up in Hokkaido, which is the northernmost island of Japan. But the Ezo spruce that grow in Hokkaido have relatively long needles. The best of the best in terms of Ezo spruce and foliage type actually grow in the Kunashir Islands further north of Hokkaido. So what Mr. Kato used to do with his father back in the, it must have been in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, maybe even in the 20s, they would travel up to the very top of Hokkaido. They'd get on a boat and they take the boat over to the Kunashir Islands and search for Ezo spruce that they could collect. And most of these Ezo spruce are growing in sort of boggy type situations. Uh, so they were relatively easy to collect from what I understand, uh, but they'd collect a handful each time they'd go up, bring them back down to uh, Omiya 
which is just north of Tokyo, and then plant those trees up, train them as bonsai, and then sell them. So several of those trees, a lot of those trees actually that they collected uh, and that other people in the area collected back in those days uh, are still in circulation in the bonsai community in Japan. So some of those trees are you know, hundreds and hundreds of years old when they were collected, and now they've been out of the mountains or out of the bogs for close to 100 years at this point you know, in a container during that period. And some of these trees are still actually at Monsan, which is really cool. So if you go to Monsan, you enter into the nursery, uh, you walk through the front gate, on the left-hand side in that front corner of the nursery, a lot of the Ezo spruce, uh, particularly the Ezo spruce forest plantings that Saburo Kato put together are still there. Uh, they're still alive. They're still growing beautifully in that front corner. Uh, and they've sort of set up a, almost like a little tribute kind of shrine to Saburo Kato with those trees there. It's really, really cool. So definitely check that out if you make it up to Monsan at any point in the future. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, the sort of fame of Mr. Kato, uh, not only was he famous in Japan for this work, but he was also famous overseas uh, for his work, particularly with forest and rock plantings. And one thing that Fujikasa told me was that Saburo Kato recognized that when foreigners would come into the nursery back in the 1970s, 1980s, the first thing they would gravi uh, gravitate towards were the forest and the rock plantings. So in, in order to sort of promote bonsai overseas uh, to the foreign crowd, he really started focusing on building forests and rock plantings. And uh, one thing that he was really good at was building uh, multi-species forest plantings, which is actually a very difficult thing to do. 99% uh, of the time when you see a forest planting in bonsai culture, it's the same species. And not only that, it's genetically identical trees. So it's not just seedlings that are taking, taken from a tree and then slapped together. They're actually typically cuttings or air layers that are put together so that the foliage type is exactly the same. Same size, you know, same uh thickness, same uh, rate of color change, for example, if it happens to be a deciduous tree. So they're all genetically identical because their cuttings or air layers off the same parent plant. Well, Saburo Kato decided to set that aside and actually select different species, not just uh, different seedlings from the same species, but different species and put them together. So he would put forests together that had Japanese maple, trident maple, uh, you know, hornbeam, uh, juniper, azalea, all sorts of things all mixed together into one. But somehow he was able to build them and, and turn them into something that was aesthetically pleasing and beautiful to look at. The issue is that there aren't very many of those left that he had created back in those days. You don't really see too many of them today in Japan or, or anywhere, uh, having been exported you know, to Europe or, or China or anywhere else in the world. So they've sort of fallen out of favor uh, for the most part. And as a matter of fact, forest plantings in general in Japan aren't really that popular anymore, at least not relative to the popularity, say, in, in the U.S. or in, uh, in Europe. Um, but it's still interesting, you know, when we have people to ASAN, the first thing they gravitate towards is that forest planting or a tree that's planted on a rock. So Mr. Kato is definitely on to something in that regard. It probably just has something to do with, you know, creating kind of a natural scene that you could sort of see yourself being shrunken down uh, and walking through the forest, for example, or walking along a cliffside with that tree sort of dangling off the cliff in terms of a rock planting. Uh, so I think it, it really speaks to people in that regard. But that was one reason why Mr. Kato's nursery became so famous outside of Japan was because he really promoted bonsai through the creation of forest plantings and rock plantings to that foreign crowd that would come to the nursery. So, you know, we don't have that many here at ASAN, uh, but I'm looking forward to creating more rock plantings going forward. Uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the models that I use for creating rock plantings and for forest plantings is Saburo Kato's book called Forest Rock Plantings and Ezo Spruce Bonsai. So this is a fantastic book. If you don't have it, definitely get a copy of it. Uh, but he sort of takes you through the process of how to plant trees on rocks, how to create an aesthetic, uh, aesthetically pleasing and beautiful looking forest planting, for example. I um, mean, he's got a lot of pictures of trees that he had created over the years, and then also a lot of diagrams in there, uh, sort of you know drawings of what forest planting should look like, uh, you know different styles. Uh, if it's an alpine species, it should look like this. If it's a species that grows near the river, it should look like this. When you compile it into a forest planting. So definitely get your hands on uh, this book. Um, I believe stonelantern.com uh, sells it, um, but you can probably find it in many different outlets online, maybe even on Amazon as well. But uh, it's Forest Rock Plantings and Ezo Spruce Bontai. All right, so the first time that I actually met Saburo Kato, I was, how old was I? I was 20, 
20 years old. Yep, 20 years old. So uh, I was studying Japanese language at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And my major, it was a sort of a double major, uh, Japanese language and business. So to complete the Japanese language component of the degree, I had to spend uh, a year in Japan at a university uh, studying the language. So I ended up going to uh, it's Mekon University, which was a private school that had uh, an affiliation with the University of Tennessee. Uh, and that school was located in the Kinugasa area of Kyoto, which is right near Kinkakuji or the the uh, Golden Pavilion. So it's a really beautiful area of Kyoto. Uh, but during that year, I applied for a scholarship that was, it wasn't very much, it was like $750 scholarship from the University of Tennessee that was designed for students who were studying abroad to actually learn about a cultural art in the country where they were studying. So I applied for it, said that I wanted to you know, study bonsai uh, in some capacity while I was in Japan, uh, and I actually got the scholarship. So you know, back then there weren't any bonsai schools in Japan like what you see today, where you could go for you know two weeks to two months, you pay a fee and you study at the nursery. They didn't have that back in those days. This was you know, I'm let's see, 33 now, it's 20 back then, so 13 years ago. You didn't really see any of that. Um, so there was an opportunity to go study at a nursery, uh, but the next be best thing was to join a tour that would take you to the different nurseries to see them. So I contacted uh, my friend Bill Valvanis, who at the time didn't know me you know, from a rock on the ground, uh, but we've since become pretty good friends. But in any case, I contacted him and asked if I could join his tour uh, which every year he hosts a tour uh, to the Kokofu in February. Um, so he said, yeah, you can join the tour. Uh, you know, it costs more than the $750, but if you do a little bit of translation on the tour, I'll let you come on the rest of it uh, at no charge, which was really cool of him uh, to do that for me. So, you know, I sent him the 750 bucks, uh, joined his tour, did a little bit of translation, but I remember going to Saburo Kato's nursery uh, with Bill on that tour, and I sat down next to him, and of course, you know, I'm six foot, almost six foot six, uh, you know, blonde hair, blue eyed kid, sit down next to Saburo Kato, and he had no idea that I was going to be translating for the day. So I leaned over to him and introduced myself in Japanese, and his eyes got huge. They just totally opened up. And if you've ever seen photos of Saburo Kato, even back you know in the 1980s, 1970s, he, his eyes were very, very small. He always looked like he was you know squinting or almost asleep. Um, but as soon as I spoke to him in Japanese, his eyes opened super wide. I, I freaked him out a little bit, but you know we started having a conversation and, and got to talking and. I actually had a copy of his book, That Forest Rock Planting and Ezra Spruce Bonsai, with me, and I asked him if he would sign the book for me, and he graciously did, which is very cool. I actually have it right in front of me right here with a signature in it, which is very, very cool. Uh, but there's a photo that was taken of me sitting next to him, uh, and I'll see if I can find uh, that photo and post a link to it in the show notes uh, so you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about. But you can see sort of the surprise on his face <laughs> in the picture. Um, uh, they didn't capture it exactly when I started speaking to him, so that his eyes aren't as wide as they were right when I uh, opened my mouth for the first time. But you can see what I looked like back in the day and what he looked like. And this was, you know, uh, 2007, I believe. So, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, you know, so he passed away, like I said, I think about nine years ago. So this was only, you know, four or five years prior to his passing. Um, but it was really cool to actually get to sit down and talk to him, meet him. And then when I went back for my apprenticeship and we started taking trees up to the Kokofu, uh, he didn't recognize me at all, of course. Uh, but we got to talking again. I reminded him of, you know, having met him during Bill's tour and, and he remembered me at that point, which was very, very cool. So it was nice to have gotten to, you know, speak to him a little bit while he was still alive, get to see the nursery, you know, prior to it changing after his passing, um, and then to watch the transformation of Monsean in the last few years. It's been very, very cool to, to watch that and to be a part of that, even if, you know, from a distance for the most part. So, um, you know, that's really all I wanted to talk about in this episode. I thought it was just kind of a, a cool way to kick off 2020 and talk a little bit about the past in Japan. I hope you guys like this episode. Let me know in an email if you uh, want to hear about a specific topic going forward. You can send those emails to podcast at bjornbjornhome.com and uh, I will try to answer those questions in a future episode. So until the next time, take care and I hope you guys are having a great start to your 2020. Thank you for checking out this episode of the Bonsai Network podcast. To have your questions answered in a future episode, please send them to podcast at bjornbjornhome.com. That's podcast at bjornbjornhome.com.